Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is uh, Jack Nasser. I'm the chairman of uh, BHP Billiton, and I have the pleasure of introducing our guests this evening. At the outset, uh, I want to take the opportunity to recognise Dick Woolcott, uh, the founding director of the Asia Society Australasia Centre. Uh, Dick has provided the energy and the focus that over the years have been the compass to guide the contributions of the Asia Society for our part of the world. I was reminding Dick that uh, many years ago, it was actually in the late 70s, I was sent as, as a much younger person to run the operations of Ford in the Philippines. And when I arrived, they said, well, there's this very capable, crusty Aussie ambassador. You, you should go down there and, and, and have a meeting with him. And I, I, I still recall those days. And uh, Dick was of great help uh, to me at, at that point. And uh, I, I've been a, a fan of his ever since. The strength of ties between the Asia-Pacific nations has in many ways been facilitated by you, Dick, uh, together with the work of uh, Sid Meier and others such as Hugh Morgan. I'm told Hugh uh, is hosting some of our visitors down in the Margaret River area of, of Western Australia. So, um, Dick, we, we appreciate you being here with us uh, tonight. I'd also like to extend a very cordial welcome to His Royal Highness, the Prince of Tonga, and also the Honourable uh, Prime Minister of Tonga. The governments of Australia and Tonga enjoy a strong relationship supported by several cooperative programs, uh, but just as importantly, our people share close ties through education, through sports, business, and other institutions. We're extremely fortunate to have uh, Bob Zollick here tonight to speak about the changing economic landscape, uh, particularly in the midst of the present turmoil in the global markets. Uh, and it's very timely, Bob, that you're here to give us your prognosis and views. I'd be uh, particularly interested to hear how the World Bank is going to be funded uh, because as you sort of trip around the globe and countries are losing their credit ratings and countries are squeezing budgets everywhere, uh, I'm, I'd be personally interested in, in just how the funding um, or, or the tightness in the markets around the world will impact the funding of the bank. Over the last four years, uh, Bob has presided over the World Bank, an institution that operates in 187 countries. And, and Bob, just for your uh, information, uh, I know you were in awe about BHP's operations around the world, but uh, actually you're in about seven times as many countries as, as we operate in, so uh, I, I don't envy you. Uh, the, the job of, of just making sure everything's working on time all the time. Bob has always championed the benefits of uh, the global economy, and during his time as the U.S. Trade Representative, he implemented many uh, bilateral trade agreements, and in particular, and we're thankful for this, he championed the Australian Free Trade Agreement uh, with the U.S., Remarkably, and this is an indication of his diplomatic skills, he also negotiated the entry of China and Taiwan uh, into the World Trade Organization. His contributions have been broadly recognized around the globe, and his honors include the Alexander Hamilton and Distinguished Service Awards, the Department of Defense Medal for Distinguished Public Service, the highest decorations of the U.S. Uh, Department of Treasury and also the U.S. State Department and the German Knight Commander's Cross. It's my hope that the presence of global leaders like Bob Zollick inspire Australia and the region to embrace innovation, 
and productivity for the benefit of all. As the chairman of uh, BHP Billiton, this is particularly relevant to Australia's natural resources and the great potential those resources have to lift the living standards of our region, particularly as we witness a global rebalancing of economic power and influence. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Bob Zolik and Dick Woolcock. Thank you very much, Jack, for those very fulsome remarks. <laughs> yeah. uh, I think we're ready to go, Bob? I'm ready. Okay. Um, well, I think we should start with the obvious question which Jack has just touched on in, on, in his introduction. Um, and no doubt a number of people in this room will be um, uh, watching the markets when they open on Monday morning. Um, so you want for, me to be a front runner? For the, <laughs> for the start of a new week. Um, you know, as we all know, the, the world stock markets have um, uh, gone through a very turbulent and volatile week, sparked, I would think, by the uh, US um, uh, downgrading, credit downgrade, and the continuing Eurozone uh, debt problems. And I think perhaps we might start as a first question, which Jack also raised in his introduction as to uh, what is your assessment of the risks to the global economy at the present time? Well, uh, let me, uh, if you will, Dick, uh, just thank all of you for joining us. This is a great uh, crowd, and when uh, I told Dick that I was coming to, uh, to Sydney between this meeting we just had at the American-Australian Leadership Group in Perth, and I'm heading on to, uh, to Canberra, um, he asked about... Uh, joining all of you from the Asia Society, and we were a little worried about Sunday night, so I really appreciate uh, all of you coming because I always learn an awful lot uh, when I come to Australia. Obviously, you're at the heart of the Asia Pacific, and so I very much appreciate all of you joining us. Um, I also want to acknowledge the Prime Minister of Tonga. We're going to be meeting uh, tomorrow, but just to give you a little sense of some of the work that the World Bank does in very practical terms, uh, tomorrow we'll be... Um, talking about and formally announcing uh, an investment that uh, the World Bank through IFC, our private sector arm, is making in Tonga with the Asian Development Bank to put in a high-speed internet service uh, by 2013 to help connect Tonga uh, to the rest of the world. We've already done a heck of a job in the mobile telecommunications area where we've increased usage from about 6 to 60 percent. So it also gives you a little feel. One of the things I'll be talking with the government about is kind of how we try to support um, Australia's agenda in development because we've greatly expanded our activities here in terms of uh, working with the Pacific countries. I want to uh, acknowledge Prime Minister Keating's presence because obviously there were a lot of people that uh, played a key role in positioning Australia with the economic foundations that it has today, but I think Prime Minister Keating was definitely one of the leaders of that and also with a strong orientation with the Asia Pacific and my, it's always been my view that I know there's been debates at times about Australia with Britain or Australia with the United States or Australia with Japan and Australia with uh, China and the Asia Pacific and my view is you really don't have to choose. If you can play in multiple leagues you actually are going to be more effective overall and I think that was kind of the heart of the Prime Minister's policy which also played a key role with, uh, uh, with APEC uh, going forward. And I also very pleased uh, my friend Julie Bishop, who's been part of this. Uh, I've met her through the leadership dialogue. One of the wonderful things I just have to say for the American participants in that dialogue is the level of participation we get across parties, business, academic, is really extraordinary. Um, and in very practical terms, um, I started the dialogue when it just began uh, some 20 years ago. And uh, those ties ended up uh, being quite critical when we wanted to get the Australian US FTA through because there was a period there where we were working with the coalition government. This was in 2003, 2004, uh, the LibNAT coalition, and little sensitivities on some of the Labor Party side. And frankly, 
we worked very closely with, at that time, Kevin Rudd, Steve Smith, and kind of maneuvered the whole process through. So it had some very practical uh, orientation. I want to thank Jack Nasser and uh, Dean Cameron for uh, their support and activities of this. And I would be remiss, since I mentioned the dialogue, I was so pleased to see former premiers uh, Greiner and Carr are here tonight because they really made wonderful contributions to the whole uh, dialogue process. Um, and one last brief one, since, uh, uh, since Jacques asked about the World Bank's position, I, this gives me a golden opportunity. We're a AAA credit. <laughs> we're, we're a flight to quality. <laughs> uh, I, uh, people often, you know, don't have a full sense of the role of the World Bank, but it's a pretty modern and sophisticated financial institution, so I track pretty closely how our bonds trade, and uh, we've been in a pretty uh, actually attractive and comfortable position. Uh, now, I have to say, we still don't trade it at U.S. Treasury, so even though they're AA plus, uh, but our spread isn't too different. Um, and part of that is just to give you a little feel, is that um, we, as in both the IBRD part, the World Bank part that works with governments, and IFC, our private sector side, we have a separate capitalization. So we, they're originally shareholders, 187 shareholders, and they have about $11 billion of paid in capital to the bank side, but we've added about $30 billion of reserves. And our liquidity position, frankly, would allow us to go for about another year without um, going to markets if we had to. Uh, but actually, this is a pretty attractive time for us to go to markets, including, by the way, uh, we've done some kangaroo bonds uh, in Australia. <laughs> so, and, uh, and if you think about what we're talking about emerging markets, I'll just add, the people that I lend to are getting to be credits that are moving up, not coming down. <laughs> so so those, those markets are in reasonably good shape, but we don't take anything for granted, that's for sure. Um, the situation in the markets. Um, I'll start with the fact that... Um, Prior to the past couple of weeks, what I've been observing about the nature of this downturn in the recovery is that um, it, it's been unusual in recoveries uh, over the sort of post-World War II period in that it's a, it's a multi-speed recovery. What you see is in the emerging markets, the recovery has been quite strong. Uh, and if anything, with a lot of our client countries the worry that I had uh, coming into the summer was the danger of some overheating, some asset price bubbles, and so we were working with countries with some of those issues. While the major developed markets have obviously uh, been struggling and uh, have the problems of sovereign debt um, and have problems of unemployment and job creation. Um, and so part of the challenge for a group like the G20, which I participate in at both the finance minister's level and the heads of government level, was how do you deal with an international economy that's changing in that nature? That's a very different world than the old G7 uh, economy. Now, I think what's happened in the past couple of weeks is there was a convergence of some events in Europe and the United States that has led many uh, market participants um, to uh, lose confidence in the economic leadership of, of some of the key countries. And what we've seen is that, you know, confidence is a, is a fragile um, sort of element of how any market economy works. And uh, I think that those events combined with some of the other fragilities in the nature of the recovery have um, pushed us into a new danger zone. And I don't say those words lightly. You get a little bit of a sense from Jacques' description. I've been involved with these international economic events. I was at the, H at the U.S. Treasury in the 87 financial crisis. I've been through a number of these uh, situations. Um, but I highlight it uh, not to create a sense that everybody should run out of the room and call their broker, uh, and it is still <laughs> Sunday, um, but, uh, and you're ahead of the markets elsewhere. But, but, uh, but so that policymakers recognize and, and take this seriously for what it is. Now, um, to be more specific, I think, um, as is always the case, you, you can't just use a blanket analysis. Uh, I think that uh, in, in the Eurozone, the problem, which is understandably understandable in political terms, and I've worked an awful lot with Europe that Knight Commander's Cross came for being the U.S. negotiator in German unification, um, but one of the things that has happened in Europe is that 
the, the process of dealing with the sovereign debt, but more than the sovereign debt, some of the competitiveness issue, um, have been done always kind of a, uh, a day late and a euro short, I guess I'd say. And so uh, it's natural if countries have to come together in that process, but that it might not uh, be what you really need when you run into a major financial or fiscal problem, which is to get ahead of it, to sort of jump ahead and create a sense of markets that the economic leadership is not only on top of the problem, but moving it in the right direction. Uh, but I think that that is sort of accumulated, and so we're kind of moving from drama to trauma uh, for a lot of the Eurozone countries. And fundamentally, uh, we, could, we could get into the details and other questions, but it really does go back to German unification. Um, I work uh, closely with Chancellor Kohl and indeed just took part in an event that was honoring him in Germany, uh, Henry Kissinger Award, uh, in the spring. And for those of you that recall those events, um, it was a pretty uh, dramatic aspect to sort of bring Germany back together. Margaret Thatcher's view was that she loved Germany so much she wanted to have two of them. Um, <laughs> and part of the understanding that Kohl struck with Mitterrand and Jacques Delors playing a key role was that monetary union was Germany giving up the Deutschmark, which was its sort of post-war pride, uh, to create a monetary union. And the best that I can assess is, is in a sense, uh, for the Kohl's and the Mitterrands, there was an expectation, if you look at the whole European integration process, that if need be, a monetary union would be backed by a deeper fiscal union. Now, it didn't have to be that way. If, if the European Commission and others had kept to some of the standards that they required for budgets and deficits, or maybe if they'd had a slightly smaller Eurozone, it wouldn't have needed to. But I think that's the issue that people are going to face today, is that what degree you're going to have a fiscal union match uh, a monetary union. But in the process of getting there, you know, when you can't devalue your currency, it's a challenge of how you're going to return to competitiveness. So you have issues of, of debt, you have issues of competitiveness, and you also have issues that then relate to uh, the strength of banking systems. Now, I think what you're going to see in the near term, and I think Jean-Claude Trochet, who's the head of the European Central Bank is an extremely knowledgeable, skilled official, and uh, the fact that he's been buying bonds in the market is, I expect, what you'll see in terms of liquidity. His successor, Mario Draghi, is also a very talented, skilled, knowledgeable person. But the point that I, frankly, I'll make here and I would make to my European colleagues is what central banks can do is provide liquidity. That doesn't deal with the fundamentals, and so someone's going to have to get at the fundamentals, too. Now. The U.S. case is somewhat different, um, and uh, I think the reason that it contributed to the, the drop in confidence in markets is not that the United States faces sort of an imminent problem, but frankly, markets are used to the United States playing a key role in the economic system and leadership, and so when they saw the Sturm und Drang in, in Congress and with the executive, it made them uncertain about, well, is the United States really know where it's going or is it going to get there. Um, and so I think the United States also faces challenges that if you take apart these efforts to cut spending in the future, so far what the Congress and the President have focused on is what we call discretionary spending um, as opposed to the entitlement programs, our Social Security, our Medicare and others. And I think that until they make an effort at those programs, I think there's going to continue to be skepticism about dealing with long-term spending and debt. But I think there's another part that is important from the U.S. side, and that is what I've just described are the, the macroeconomic issues. But you know, one of the parts that I always find refreshing when I come out to the Asia-Pacific, including Australia, is there's an attention to structural issues, the growth agenda in addition to the macroeconomic agenda. And that in some ways could be encapsulated in the U.S. by focusing heavily on this discussion you start to see about a broad-based tax reform. Uh, I was at the U.S. Treasury with Secretary James Baker in the late 80s when we did the 1986 tax reform. You broaden the base, cut rates. That would probably be a very positive uh, step uh, for the private sector. Uh, what's good in the Washington environment, you get more and more people talking about that. You got cross-party interest in it. 
having been around the last time and having some of the scars from it, it's easy to talk about in concept when you have to take away people's tax benefits. It's not so easy to do in practice. <laughs> um, but nevertheless, that's an important element for the U.S. And then the third one, people who've worked with me won't be surprised on this, is that I've always believed that free trade and open trade policies are one of the best structural reform policies you can get. And uh, that has lapsed in the United States. Uh, now, I, I'm hopeful that uh, the Congress and the executive will move on the three free trade agreements that, frankly, are left over from my period, and that means it's like five or six years ago, the Colombia, the Panama, and the South Korean agreement. And then the question is where they're going to go from there. And so uh, I think there's the, the, the reason I talked about uncertainty or confidence question for economic leadership is, um, you know, all you have to do is open up the op-ed pages and you can see people discuss these issues, but someone still has to get it done. And from what they've seen, they're not sure it'll get done. And I'll just close with this point. What I've described so far is market confidence. But the real issue here is whether the market confidence then goes to business confidence and consumer confidence. Um, and those are some of the issues that we don't know yet, uh, although the most recent consumer confidence numbers for the United States weren't too encouraging on that, uh, which while occurring in Australia. So um, I think this is a period where, frankly, I'm trying to do what I can from my platform to try to encourage the right set of policies. And the only thing I'll add to it, but we can take this up in a separate point, is what is different from the world of the past is now these emerging markets are sources of growth and opportunity. So about half of global growth is now represented by the developing world. And that is uh, compared even in the 90s, Prime Minister Kennedy was dealing with some of these issues, it was about 20%. So this is a very rapid change in a relatively short span of time in historical terms. <coughs> Thanks very much, Bob. Um, perhaps another issue I might raise with you is that uh, Australia's economic health is, as you uh, know, increasingly linked uh, with China. Um, <coughs> excuse me. How do you see uh, China's latest five-year plan uh, with its greater emphasis on its domestic markets and its enormous growth of middle classes in certain cities um, and also its emphasis on um, really the quality of, uh, of growth rather than the quantity of growth. Um, how do you see that affecting the, uh, uh, its capacity to cope with a variety of problems, but particularly including inflationary pressures? Right. Well, let's take the one mm -hmm. you ended with, inflation. Um, uh, and I'll, take, I'll divide this into near term and sort of medium and long term. Um, I talked about this risk of overheating. If you go back and you look at to what becomes disruptive events in uh, Chinese politics, inflation ranks rather high. And as probably all of you are well aware, being involved with the Asia Society, you're going into a phase of of leadership transition here in 2011 and 2012. And I'll just share with you that from some of my uh, Chinese colleagues uh, at the bank and elsewhere, what they've emphasized to me is that the one thing that could disrupt what everybody expects to be the transition, particularly uh, uh, going into 2012, uh, would be an inflation rate that starts to get to 8, 9, 10% because that would be seen as a very serious problem. So you saw the report of about 6.4, 6.5% over the past week. The reason I think you've seen some of this appreciation of the currency is that I think that probably tipped the balance internally, the idea that the currency appreciation, of course, is a way that you can counter inflation. Um, but some of the people who were concerned about exports would have been resisting that. Uh, obviously, you can raise interest rates, too, but that might have created some other concerns. And so, <clears throat> as is uh, often the case, uh, I think, with China, y you have to build a consensus around these policies. And I think that those recent events and the sensitivity of the transition has probably uh, heightened that. Some of that inflation is related to another problem we're spending a lot of time on at the bank, which is um, food price inflation, and that's a bigger uh, sort of structural set of changes that we have going on. But uh, looking a little bit beyond the uh, near term, I will actually be returning across the Pacific uh, in late August, early September for some mm -hmm. discussions with the Chinese 
uh, leadership on a very interesting project that we launched um, at the World Bank with China about a year ago. And I'll share it with you because I, I find it somewhat intriguing, not only in the substance, but what it tells you about Chinese thinking. Um, last year was the 30th anniversary of the World Bank's relationship with China. And uh, the World Bank's brand with China is an extremely good one. Going back to Robert McNamara, there's a real appreciation, not so much even for the financing, but the knowledge and the intellectual debate. And there's times where the court past 30 years where the World Bank would do some significant pieces of analytical work. And there was one, there was like a three-day boat trip down the Yangtze River, which was an ongoing seminar about these issues. And I think part of it was important with the sharing of knowledge, but I think it was equally important within the Chinese policy development system to kind of create the catalyst for consensus. So as I was preparing to go to China for our 30th anniversary last uh, autumn, this one Chinese official said, you know, um, there are people thinking in China about some of the next generation issues, including how do we avoid the middle income trap? You know, countries start to get to three to six per thousand dollars per capita income a year and they start to level off. And how do we, you know, we, everybody knows uh, the what uh, that we should be rebalancing, but what's the how? How we really should we do this? And how should we change with the in nature of the international economy? Um, and uh, so I presented to uh, President Hu and Executive Vice Premier Li Keqing the idea that we might do a joint project together, which they promptly embraced and gave us a, a counterpart for the state council to do this work. And when I go there in late August and September, we're kind of at the penultimate draft stage of sharing and discussing this. Now, just to give you one reference point that I find startling, this is from our work, uh, not from China's, but per capita income in China today is about $5,000 a year. You with with reasonable growth rates, so you know the, you can never judge a straight line. But so we're in 2011. Uh, by 2030, uh, you, you could be at $20,000 a year uh, in sort of real capital income. That would be less than the growth rate that they've had uh, over the past uh, 30 years, but it'd still be a pretty strong growth rate. If China in 2030, uh, it, it was sort of real uh, sort of exchange rates or or with the sort of with real dollars has a per capita income of about that level, that's like having 25 South Koreas. <laughs> You're the Asia society. It's not only China. Think about 25 South Koreas. Okay? So one of the things that I think the Chinese are well aware of is that the growth model that they've used for the past 30 years simply is not sustainable. It's got to change. And um, this, in part, the rest of the international economy couldn't absorb that. Now, you asked about, let me just also give you a little flavor of this, and I mentioned some of these at the, the leadership dialogue, and I think some people found these startling. Um, and don't hold me with the precise numbers, but these are roughly the numbers. China now consumes about 53% of the world's cement. It absorbs about 58%, uh, I think, of the world's uh, uh, iron ore. About, or I mean, uh, 40, uh, about 47 percent of the world's iron ore, about 45 percent of the steel, about 40 percent of the zinc, aluminum, about half the world's pigs, uh, <laughs> about 37 percent of the world's eggs, about a quarter of the world's soybeans. These are big numbers. <laughs> um, and what it also suggests is some of the resource utilization rates are going to have to change too in China in the context. Um, so. Uh, we won't change them too much. We want BHP Billiton and Mineral Resources to be able to have a good, good uh, demand there. But, but what is striking uh, is that um, what we've started to discuss with the Chinese are the following types of issues. The, the approach that China has taken on the environment has been grow fast, clean up later. And all of you are well aware, if you've had any contact with China, it was very costly. And so one idea is can you come up with a more of a green growth path? And can you do this not only with your priorities, but also your pricing and other aspects? A second aspect is the Chinese financial system has really been used as a fiscal device. It's the banking systems, you know, for all their market value and all the other aspects have sort of operated as a financing uh, mechanism for the government. And so they, then they get bad debts and people use the resources to pay them off. 
it probably makes a lot of sense for China to actually modernize the fiscal system. And this has implications for even things like provincial and local government financing. Right now, most of those governments that you see, you know, outside in the provinces or the cities, when they fund themselves, they do it through land sales. And they also do it through, I might add, off balance sheet enterprises, and this creates other types of uh, uh, vehicles that create different risks. So it makes a lot of sense for risk management to change that. Um, another dimension um, is, you know, the question would be what, what should be the role of the state in some of these sectors uh, versus having market determination for land, uh, for uh, labor, for some of the other components. Um, another key issue in China is um, in the next five years, there'll be uh, more people leaving the labor force in China than coming in. I mean, this is a shocking things, right? But it's the effect of the one-child policy. And so um, you obviously, you've got a very strong interest in moving up the value-added chain. Uh, and, and, and it would say they'd want to do anyway, because if you want to have higher per capita incomes, you've got to be able to have higher productivity. So what's a strategy to move up uh, the value-added chain? Well, part of it, of course, is the discussion on innovation. And you hear the discussion about indigenous innovation. And this is the, quite a contentious topic in China, and as it would be in many countries, because there's certain groups that say, look, we got 1.3 billion people. If we just you know, have up our own standards and kind of keep everybody else out, that's a pretty big market. We can do it for ourselves. But the whole model, going back to Deng Xiaoping, is to link to the international economy. And while there may be specific interests that like this, the people who are looking across the economy say, well, where would that leave us in terms of linking to innovation that's going to occur in the United States or Australia or in other locations? So will you have an indigenous innovation policy or an open innovation policy? And also the question, what will be your linkage to the international economy? So I came up with this comment when I was at the State Department as, uh, about China seeking or urging China to be a responsible stakeholder. It was benefited from the international system. It had a stake in it going to share the responsibilities. Um, I said over the weekend, I think China is a, little, is a stakeholder, but perhaps today a little bit more of a reluctant stakeholder. <laughs> but there's an active debate in China about, well, how should it engage on some of these issues? And, and just to give you sort of the reality of this, I mean, we have, uh, in addition to our normal funding arrangement, we have a fund for the 79 poorest countries called IDA, where we give grants and very long-term loans without interest. And we have to raise the money every three uh, years. And this is a question of last, for the last one cycle we raised, uh, it was about $49 billion. Now, some of this is recycled funds. But I was able to get China in my first time at the bank three years ago to start to make a minimal contribution, very minimal compared to the rest. But this last time, rather than they actually increased the direct contribution, but I uh, sat down with them and said, look, what would be most helpful because they had some IDA credits from earlier. They no longer get IDA. Um, could you prepay your IDA? Could you put it back in? And uh, so they agreed to prepay a few billion dollars of IDA. Okay? Now, for many of you know the Chinese system, this is also, it's, it was instructive. If I had gone out and made a press interview and said, oh, now you shall do this and you have to do it, it would have never worked. But we kind of worked with them and they were willing to play these contributions. And one of the other issues, which we, again, can get about in the question and answer is, if you get into moving up the value-added chain, there's about 85 million low-value-added jobs in China, and where might those go in the world economy? And, might, and we're actually starting to work with them now about how we might be able to create the context and environment for some of those jobs to move to sub-Saharan Africa. So when you think about relations with China, and I talked about the international dimensions and coming back to the the next 12 five-year plan. What I find encouraging is, you know, China's ask, the, these are, we talk about structural reforms in the U.S. or Europe, these are pretty big structural reforms. And I guess what I would conclude with is this, is that if you look at the 11th five-year plan, some of these ideas about shifting to more domestic demand and others, they're in there. They didn't really get implemented. Now, one reason may have been because with the financial crisis, the Chinese used a stimulus strategy based on investment, like they did in 97. And in some ways, they went to with what they were comfortable with. So the US actually did what it was comfortable with, which is sort of a consumption base. The Chinese did investment base. So the language in the 12 five-year plan is pretty good. But the question is translating the language into action. And so I hope in a modest way, some of these things that we're 
talking about what the Chinese uh, can move them into what rebalancing means in fact. And I would add one other benefit for, the, for Australia and the U.S. and others, uh, Europe, is that part of this will be to change some of the oligopolies in the service sector industry, which could create new business opportunities. And also, as they do so, higher productivity, which will lead to higher wages. <coughs> Thank you very much indeed, Bob. That was a very uh, full answer. Um, <laughs> it's a big country. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, well, you I mean, I was amazed. I hadn't sort of really studied, but I came across it the other day, that China now has five cities of more than 10 million and 23 cities of... Uh, more than five million. I mean, yeah, it's straight. You know, uh, for again, people in Australia know this well. In the United States, it's not quite as common. But you know, there's cities whose names you've never even heard of that are you know way beyond <coughs> big yeah. cities in Europe or the U.S. Well, our trade minister Craig yes, Emerson has just come back this morning from visiting five major cities to look at sort of service op opportunities in the services, uh, which don't and those cities don't include Beijing and Shanghai. Uh, <coughs> you've always had a uh, strong, um, or been a strong advocate of um, uh, emerging markets, and this was mentioned by Sid in his introduction, of course. Uh, which countries, say, other than um, China and India, um, uh, have the best growth prospects in the Asian region, you know, especially countries like Indonesia or Vietnam? Um, and, you know, what, uh, to what extent do you think they are, those sort of countries will be... Um, affected by the fallout from the United States and uh, Eurozone problems and how they get to affect developing countries. Well, Dick, I'm a financial guy, but as you know, I was also trained as a diplomat, <laughs> so I'm not ready to insult half my shareholders at the benefit <laughs> of the other. <laughs> um, sorry, yeah. but, but let me try yeah. it this way. Um, yes, they're all but, members of yours. Oh, I should have, oh, should have thought of that. <laughs> Australia and the United States, as this audience knows, has slightly different traditions on our relationship with Great Britain. We had this revolution. And one of the defining events at the end of the revolution was a siege at a place called Yorktown in Virginia. Oh, yeah. And at the end of the siege, the British Army played a song called The World Heart Turned Upside Down <laughs> as they surrendered to, they tried to surrender to the French and for once the French were extremely gracious and they pointed to George Washington, they had to surrender to Washington. Um, but in a way, the emerging markets represent a world turned upside down from even 10 years ago. And so uh, rather than pick favorites, what I'll emphasize, we talked about China and obviously in audiences like this, China gets much of the attention. Um, but I guess my major message is it runs far beyond China. Now, this audience knows Southeast Asia quite well. You know about the huge potential there. But let me take it to a further jump that you might not think about as much. Um, Sub-Saharan Africa uh, grew <clears throat> on average 5 to 6 percent over the past decade prior to the financial crisis. And since the financial crisis, they were already back up to uh, pre-crisis levels. Now, this includes a great variety of different uh, economies. Uh, some are natural resource based, some are struggling with post-conflict and have gone into negative numbers. Uh, some have been growing quite well and, and, and uh, quite regularly. And actually, if you, if you take those three categories, you can roughly divide the population of Sub-Saharan Africa into thirds. There's about a third that is growing on a regular basis, a third that is kind of natural resource based or really more oil and energy based, and then a third that's sort of post-conflict. And uh, for that first third, what they really want are the same things that, frankly, you might have heard Europeans talking about 50 or 60 years ago. They want infrastructure, they want energy, they want regional integration linked to global markets. The difference with Europe 50 or 60 years ago is the Africans talk more about a private sector than Europe would have talked about 50 or 60 years ago. And um, there are significant uh, potential there. And again, just to give you a market basis of this, <clears throat> One of the innovations that I was pleased to um, institute at the bank was IFC is our private sector arm. And uh, with the rise of sovereign wealth funds, I had the, the idea from a famous American called Willie Sutton, who when asked, why do you rob banks, said, well, that's where the money is. <laughs> so, so I thought, why don't we talk to sovereign wealth funds? 
And so I, this was actually in advance of the financial crisis, but I was quite surprised quite quickly after the financial crisis, we were able to create an asset management corporation within IFC and create various investment funds for sovereign funds and pension funds and others to do investments. And we created in the past year about a billion dollar fund that's invested in sub-Saharan Africa and for some balance Latin America and the Caribbean. And we have Korean sovereign funds, Arab funds, Azeri funds, the UN pension fund, the Dutch pension fund. And when I asked the Dutch pension fund, now why, why are you coming into this? I thought their response was very instructive. They said, well, we now realize developed markets are risky too. We believe these are part of the growth potential, but particularly with Sub-Saharan Africa, we don't really know where to go yet. You know, they will over time. And so what we're trying to do is create the basis to remove some of the information and transactions costs. But uh, this runs in areas that people might not necessarily be top of mind. We are doing work with uh, the Gates Foundation about private sector healthcare delivery in Sub-Saharan Africa and the possibilities of, which by the way, represents about 50 to 60 percent of Sub-Saharan Africa's healthcare provisions. In India, it's like 80 to 90 percent. And if you think about it also from a business perspective, this is where one has to move out of the North-South framework. You're increasingly getting interesting business models from the developing world and that, that spread to other developing world countries. In the past, oh, six, seven, eight years, there's been over $50 billion invested in telecommunications in Sub-Saharan Africa that have built out a whole mobile phone network. And of course, that mobile phone network is now the basis for saving systems, banking, phone systems, so on and so forth. So I guess what I'd conclude is, um, you know, I'm not saying these are all uh, riskless and they all don't have difficulties, but what is so phenomenally different in my own sort of career, or even sort of the last 10 years of my career, I became U.S. Trade Representative in 2001, is that the vast change of these markets on the landscape. And uh, so talking about uh, business schools here in Australia and the sort of the young students, what's going to be very different from, you know, people who came out 10 or 20 years ago is that I, I don't see how you can think about business without operating in these markets. Now, the last point I'll make is this. In, at least in the case of the U.S. and Europe, I think the private sector is pretty well aware of this. People are engaged in different degrees about these growth markets. I'm not sure the policymakers are. On the one hand, they know it, but this will affect everything that I've worked on in the WTO, in development, in investment funds, and as we talked about a little bit at the dialogue, it will also affect security over time, too. Bob, thank you very, very much. I have about four or five more questions that I'd like to ask you, but we've got a large and interested audience, so we must throw it open to them now to put what questions they want to, and Sid Meyer is going to monitor that. Thank you, Vic. Um, we, we have allowed uh, some time for this conversation to continue with your questions, um, so we'll start taking questions now. And uh, if you wouldn't mind just stating a name and organization, there's a couple of uh, microphones uh, roving around the room. But, uh, but please, uh, let me invite your, your questions. Dick, might be over. Another no, one. the hand oh. is risen just there. Ah, right here, perfect, thank you. Uh, do you think the world would be better off with fewer currencies or more currencies? And if the answer is more currencies, how would you get to that point? Well, um, I sort of try to deal more with the, the reality than the theory, and let me explain what I mean by that. Uh, I, I think it's going to be more a question of, of sort of reserve currencies as opposed to currencies in general. And here, I think the reality is that the dollar for many reasons, will remain the principal reserve currency. But as I've kind of written in the Financial Times and elsewhere, um, I think that we are likely to move to a system where there will be multiple reserve currencies. And one of the challenges is the world economy isn't so used to this. You had the pound and the dollar. And, and so how will that system work? And uh, what at least I was trying to, and this is frankly part of the debate going on in the G20 and when people talk about uh, some of the comments out of Brazil about currency wars and other issues. 
Um, I think today you're like, you know, you're going to have the dollar, uh, the euro, although what happens to the euro partly depends on that discussion that I started out with. Um, the yen will play a role, but the yen has never really moved itself in part because of the nature of Japanese financial markets in that full internationalized uh, form. Uh, the pound to a limited degree. Um, and then over time, over time, I believe the RMB could be part of this, but obviously China has to move towards an open capital account. So I was actually making the case of trying to use the special drawing rights, which are you know, a created currency within the IMF system that really is just shares of, of other uh, of these currencies, to encourage China to internationalize and move towards an open capital account. But then the question, well, how do these currencies relate to one another? And I think that's where there's a role for the IMF, not going to be able to tell people what to do, but to play a certain refereeing role. And I also think what you see is, is that it, what, this goes to the confidence issue today. When there's some uncertainty about the role of these currencies today, you see people going into the Australian dollar, the Swiss franc, and gold. And that's one reason why I made the point um, got a lot of attention at the time, uh, about recognizing gold as an alternative monetary asset. And I wasn't suggesting that a gold standard, in fact, it came from a, a piece where I was talking about having flexible exchange rates and having a flexible exchange rate system and moving emerging markets uh, to that system. But I do think that what we see partly in some of the commodity prices, it's not only gold, is uh, this lack of confidence in some of the management because it really relates to my answer to the first question. People know that the central bankers are the sort of the emergency firefighters, and if they put liquidity on the market, what does that mean for sort of long-term prospects? So uh, in that sense, I saw gold and commodities as an indicator of, of, uh, of overall international monetary management. And the, the point here is, is that uh, I was with Secretary Baker at the Treasury in, in the late 80s, not only in tax reform, and if some of you may remember who've looked at this, that was the heyday of G7 economic coordination. And then all the scholars and theorists said, oh, no, it doesn't work. And if you notice, by the way, they're coming back to it now in the G20. Yeah. You're going to need something like this. And, and I'm not saying that it'll be – what I've tried to suggest for the World Bank and others is, at least for me and maybe for – at least some of the people in this audience, you kind of grew up with a multilateral system that came out of Bretton Woods. It was the grand design after World War II to say, okay, we screwed it up in the 20s and 30s. We don't want protectionism. We don't want bigger than neighbor policies. We got to change the system. This system was had sort of one retooling in the early 70s with flexible exchange rates, and then it had another slight retooling after the end of the Cold War. And my main point as part of modernizing multilateralism is going to be changing for this different world, this world toward upside down with emerging markets. And part of the aspect will be the coordination of some of these reserve currencies. And it won't be dictates. In other words, the difference in this era is we're not going to have one meeting in Bretton Woods where, frankly, there isn't a United States in the midst of World War II that can dictate the terms. Uh, but I think what you're going to see over the course of you know, the next five years, maybe 10 years, is moving to a new system, whether consciously or unconsciously. Thank you. We have I prefer consciously, by the way. <laughs> question in the middle, Malcolm Turnbull, and then back in the middle again. Thank Please. You, sir, Andrew Hewitt from Oxfam Australia. Can I just uh, turn to the development agenda? Uh, and one of the phenomena that's developed over the last few years is where most of the world's poor are living now. Two-thirds of the world's poor are living in middle-income countries. Right, as defined by about under $2 a day. Yeah. Uh, can I just explore what you think the implications are for a, a development bank like the bank, like the World Bank of that reality uh, as opposed to when most of them were living in least developed countries? Yeah. Well, a couple of thoughts. Uh, first, going back to this multilateral system issue, um, this is one of the things that makes it extremely complicated because we now have emerging markets that by dint of size and influence need to share responsibility, but many of them say, well, wait a minute, I, I still got 75% of the world's poor. Don't put too much responsibility on me right away. Or in sub-Saharan Africa, only 30% of the people have electricity. And so that's why, whether it be a climate change or trade or other issues, this is going to be very 
complicated, but it's one of the things where institutions like the World Bank and the IMF and the WTO, I think, can play a role in the G22. Now, more specifically, that issue was really front and center when I came to the bank in 2007. Because there, there, was a, there was a group that basically said, look, the World Bank shouldn't deal with middle income countries anymore. It really should just deal with what I'll call the Ida countries, the, sort of the 79 poorest countries. I very much rejected that view, and I was fortunate at the time with Hank Paulson, the Secretary of Treasury of the U.S., very much agreed with me based on his experience. Um, and it, there were a couple of reasons why. One was the one you mentioned, which is that there's still an awful lot of poor people in so-called middle-income countries. And what it means is we have to be flexible in changing the nature of our services. So if you can see a little bit of what I've talked about, with, with many countries now, it's, it's the knowledge transfer that is more important than the money transfer. And so uh, just to give you, you know, sort of three quick examples, uh, when I come back, across the Pacific uh, after China, I'm going to Singapore. We're launching an infrastructure center of excellence in Singapore that is trying to build public-private partnership models, which everybody talks about, but I'm trying to make more market friendly because infrastructure with private capital is obviously important for productivity, job creation today, productivity for tomorrow. How do we drive private capital into that? That's a big topic, frankly, across the range of developing countries. Social safety nets. One of the things that we learned in the East Asian financial crisis is that restoring macroeconomic stability is not enough. You can lose a whole generation if you lose nutrition and basic needs and others. Now, the good thing is we learned an awful lot, and there have actually been some pretty impressive programs, starting with Mexico and Brazil, having these uh, conditional cash transfer programs where basically they give money to the very poorest people on the condition they send their kids to school and people get health checkups. And we've now extended those to about 45 countries. And just to give you a sense of the real effect, when I'm working with some of the Arab, Arab Spring countries who have very large, lousy, untargeted <coughs> subsidies, we're trying to see can you use these methods. Now for some of the poorest countries, they don't really have the institutional systems yet to do those. So can we use school feeding programs? Can we use other programs? And by the way, <clears throat> this Opportunatus program, or Bolsa Familia, that's a half of 1% of GDP. So they provide really important, that's one reason you've had the big poverty reduction in Brazil, for really, you know, uh, economical basis. So part of the change for us is um, what can we share in experience in building institutions, markets, capacity, with innovative financing, uh, whether it, it may be local currency bond markets, it may be microfinance markets. Uh, frankly, we do an awful lot in terms of helping improve the public financial system so that people are able to know they get value for money or check the results. Uh, our work with the Pacific Islands obviously focuses on a whole different set of issues than it might if we're working in an Indonesian context, even though. So we have to customize the services. But there's another reason why I thought it would have been a disaster for the multilateral system to move away from the middle income countries. And if you think about what we just described, the big challenge is how are we going to share the responsibilities with these countries? How are we going to share the load, whether it be trade or climate change or investment policy or others? So it would be, to me, a mistake of cosmic proportions to push them out of the multilateral system. Because frankly, what I have to spend a lot of my time doing is kind of how do we share the loads and, and responsibilities, whether it be the China contributions to Ida as Brazil makes or Mexico makes, or frankly, the knowledge transfer or the South-South business connections. So in a sense, it's, it's the world turned upside down. It's much more of a networked economy, world economy, than the old hierarchical one that development economists used to talk about. And let me give you one other point because I something I'm actually particularly proud that we've been able to do at the bank. Um, many of you remember the anti-globalization movement, you know, w, all the demonstrations, World Bank, IMF, these big, you know, bureaucracies, so on and so forth. In part, I think, because of some of my own public sector experience, I felt that the best antidote to this was openness and transparency. So we put in a freedom of information policy uh, at the World Bank that was just related, kind of ranked number one of all uh, international, sort of multilateral and bilateral institutions. And in effect, uh, you know, we, the, the heart of it is what freedom of information people call a negative list as opposed to a positive list, as opposed to publishing which certain things. People have access to everything unless it's in a restricted category, and we actually have a tribunal, international tribunal, that allows people to determine that. 
this is, I think, very important to kind of open up these institutions and not sh they're not as scary as people think. But there's a one that I think he's even got more potential. We launched something called the Open Data, Open Information Initiative. And the story behind this is kind of interesting. I used to go to meetings like this and normally there'd be some professor in the corner that says, you know, you got some very interesting data at the World Bank, but you still charge for it. And then I'd go back to my economic staff and say, why are we charging for this? And then they'd say, well, you know, we add value and it has to be priced and so on and so forth. And while I've run a number of organizations, you know, it took me about five rounds to figure out what it amounted to was that they were getting, you know, a two or three million dollars extra for their budget every year from, <laughs> from these payments. And so I finally decided, okay, we're going to make this a public good. So we announced this year we're making 7,000 data sets uh, that date back decades uh, totally free and open to people. And it has revolutionized our contacts. And so, for example, we then, some of my economic staff is, how do we come up with new applications for these data sets? I created an apps for development competition where we brought in software developers from all over the world to figure out what new uses could they come up with with only two requirements? Use our data and relate it to the uh, Millennium Development Goals. And people came up with mapping systems, game systems, whole things that, you know, even if you'd had smart people in a room for 10 years, they'd never come up with. And I'll close with the, the last one that I'm trying to finish by the end of this year. We worked with Google to come up with a mapping system. So you can, you can get on our website and you can call up Tanzania and we'll have this done by the end of the year. We have it done for IDA projects now. We'll have it done for IBRD too. And you can see where all our projects are in Tanzania and you can push and you can get the information on the project. And the next stage that I want is so that uh, there can be an interactive capacity so that somebody in the village has a mobile phone and says, yeah, well, this is what you think is going on, but here's what's really going on. You know? And this is, this is the, the key to me also to the most fundamental part that I think the lesson of development, which is unless the local people own it, it doesn't work. And so therefore, the transparency and governance agenda is as important as the money agenda. Question here, followed by here, and then one, one at the back. I wondered if I could uh, return to China for a second, but in a global context, uh, it, I think the, the probability, uh, I presume everyone believes the probability of a double dip is higher now than it's been at any time since the, the onset of the global financial crisis. In response to the first dip, uh, China did a fiscal, fiscal and monetary stimulus about as big as the US in per capita terms and froze the exchange rate again. Uh, does China have the capacity to do those two things again if the world economy needs it? And uh, if China doesn't do that, what would happen? If China does do it, what would happen if we think China's confidence as an international actor increased dramatically after they did it and it worked last time? Well, given that I think coming into these most recent weeks, the greater problem in China was overheating. I don't think it would have that uh, room uh, to do what it did a couple of years ago. And given that I think uh, China is totally capable of managing this, but I think one of the uh, side effects of the policy of a couple of years ago is that there are going to be some bad loans <laughs> from, from uh, the, the investment um, stimulation that I don't think it's got the same freedom of, of that degree. Um, and given that inflation is a bit of a concern, I'm not sure you're going to have the freedom in terms of sort of lowering interest rates. I'm not sure I would recommend it. But where I do think there's some freedom, and this is the encouraging sign over the past days, is you could have appreciation of the currency. And I think appreciation of the currency would actually be a constructive uh, contribution. So I think as is, you know, in my work with China, over a number of years, what I found is, like other countries, they're, they're not just going to uh, sort of do something because everybody tells them to do it. You have to find uh, a, an intersection of interests, a mutuality of interests. And where uh, I think if, if you do this in a way that uh, isn't pummeling but kind of is based on sort of uh, a private discussion, you can have a better chance of trying to find those mutuality of interests. And I think right now that would primarily be the main one. I would offer a second one, but uh, this requires others to play in the game too. Look, I, I gave us some remarks in Geneva at the WTO 
about two months ago, where I, uh, as is frequently the case, tried to stand against the conventional wisdom, uh, and in this case, the conventional wisdom being that Doha was dead. And if, you know, as you may know, everybody was then saying, oh, well, let's do a mini Doha. And what they've now just learned is that's going to be just as hard as the big one, and they're not going to get a mini one done. And I said, instead of, uh, you know, declaring Doha dead, let's double down on Doha. Um, and I suggested, uh, in part because, well, I'm in a multilateral role, I am an American, so I thought it'd be better to tell the U.S. than others what to do. I said, look, the U.S. is going to be cutting farm subsidies. The U.S. is going to be cutting ethanol tariffs. Um, frankly, from a growth strategy, having some mode four, which is some movement of people, wouldn't be so bad. When I was there, some of the anti-dumping rules we could have gotten rid of. You could put together a package that would try to move this forward. Um, and this is not the conventional wisdom. I don't think it's, frankly, the perspective at this point of the administration. But I've done some of this. I have some sense of how to move and close deals. And, and I do think that you could actually put together a package that could surprise people and start to breathe life into this. But, big but, U.S. can't do it by itself. This goes to the changing world. So if I were USTR today, I'd be putting together a package like that, and then I'd be going over to China. And I'd be saying privately to the Chinese, look, you have an interest in this international system too. We avoided protectionism over the past couple of years. If this starts to really slip again over the next couple of years, I'm not so sure we'll be able to avoid protectionism. So I have my, one of my philosophies of life is the best defense is an offense, a good offense. And I would be on offense on trade. And I'd then try to get the Chinese to agree to put their some things on the table. And then I'd go to Prime Minister Singh in India and that would be a little harder because, frankly, they've got their own governmental issues. Um, and then, uh, because I think Brazil will be the toughest one at this point, because with the currency appreciation, they're not really willing to open some things up. But the reason I took some time to give you this example is that, you know, sometimes it's helpful to think out of the box. And so one way, in addition, if you want to deal with a growth strategy and you want to deal with building business confidence and you want to offset some downside risks, you know, in addition to thinking about traditional monetary and fiscal policy, why not think about a more active trade liberalization policy? And, and I think, again, if the U.S. and China put something like that together, you'd at least have a chance of having a much more positive momentum. Question down the front. And then up the back. <clears throat> yes, sir. Having lived in Australia last month for 50 years, I, I should be used to the fact that India barely gets a mention. I just mentioned uh, India. No, no, you just did in one sentence and did say, you said, apart from China and India, uh, what about the other countries? So uh, one of these days, a non-Indian will ask this question. But uh, could I ask you, you know, what role do you see India playing? It, it, it is now our third largest export market, Australia's third largest one of our biggest sources of skilled migrants, temporary migrants, overseas students. The value of resources that we say are human resources are our greatest resources. And yet India doesn't seem to get a mention. So what do you see as the role of India from a world economy point of view, a world bank point of view, and perhaps from an Australian point of view if you want? Yeah, it is probably a fair and good point. We talked about this a little bit at the dialogue and some of the, I was a little surprised, I didn't realize some of the limitations in the Australian context with India. Because in contrast, if I were meeting the Asia Society in New York, India would figure much larger. And is for reasons you probably know from strategic as well as economic as well as people and, and investment, India looms very, very large in the U.S. thinking. And when I uh, talk about the world turned upside down, my normal starting point is China and India, but then making sure that people realize the ASEANs and others in the process. Now, India, um, of course, faces a different set of development challenges. Um, and uh, one of the reasons, I guess, in some of these contexts, uh, I, I try to have a little sensitivity to the Indian position is that in the U.S., sometimes there's this view that India, like China, is sort of this steamrolling economic power. And one of the points I do, I try to remind people is, if you look at the human development characteristics in some of the Indian states, they're below that of sub-Saharan Africa. So India is almost a model of what I said, where on the one hand, 
you've got extremely world-class competitive industries that are investing around the world, and then you've got extreme poverty. And when I visited Rajasthan a year or so ago, I, remember, I came away thinking, India is a place where you can visit five centuries in one country. You know, you got the 21st and about the 16th in some places. Right? Um, now, I, I think that, uh, you know, the, the, the growth policy starting with the 1991 changes has obviously opened things up tremendously. Uh, the reason I made a little offhand political reference is that obviously uh, Prime Minister Singh and the uh, the coalition, the Congress-led coalition, I think will find it harder to move forward its agenda. But the good news is, whether it was the BJP or Congress, I think there's a pretty good consensus in India moving forward, and that's always the best sign. Um, I think one of the most important needs to increase long-term productivity um, is the infrastructure development. And that's why... uh, India is kind of one of our major players as we try to think about uh, at the World Bank uh, how to build the public-private partnership model. But India is also an example from the development side of something else. We we are increasingly kind of trying to work with states, Rajasthan, Bihar, others, where um, these these are loans that go through the World Bank system. But in addition to development projects, we're really developing the governmental capacity in these states. Um, and this is everything from fiduciary and transparency to public financial management. So uh, in, in my perspective, uh, India looms as large as China in terms of this future economy. But the problems are very different. And, uh, and I think right now, it's a little unfortunate, uh, but you know, India is a democracy. These things happen just as they happen in Australia and the U.S. Is that it's going to go through a phase where I think things may be a little slowed down, at least relative to what I would wish. Thank you. We've got- oh, one other thing, uh, just when I talked about South South, see, this is also gives you a little sense how the World Bank is changing. We're working with Indian companies, like I mentioned, Indian hospitals too. Is that this is a w- a wonderful example of business models. I'll give you two, actually. It, it, I don't know if there's anybody here from the telecommunications industry, but in the U.S., if you talk to a telecommunications executive, the basic business model is revenue per customer. So you get the customer, and then you kind of add on all different services that you charge for. <laughs> One of the things that was striking that we learned in, in India was, and this reflects, in a sense, the inexpensive technology, is that if you get enough people, minutes can be your revenue model. And so uh, it, you design the business differently. You can have a lot of people that are a lot lower level of income, but they have a lot of minutes and you can make a lot of money. And this is frankly what drove some of the mobile telephone changes that I described in Sub-Saharan Africa. And similarly in healthcare, um, as you undoubtedly know, that if you look at some areas like cataract care, cardiac care, you get extremely high quality care by any global standard at much lower cost with the hospital-based Indian systems. And I think it's probably because they use the machines about 24 hours a day and you don't have the tort lawyers that you have in the United States in malpractice suits. (laughs) But I mention these for another reason, and that is I try this in the U.S. with only modest success. But in addition to talking about South-South, there's some interesting South-North possibilities, okay? And... um, and, uh, in, in you, you know, the U.S. is a big country. People, they're kind of, they figure they can debate all their ideas. Is that there's a lot of, there are interesting lessons of business models and policy issues that would be useful to draw from developing countries. And I'll close with this one because it also involves Australia. You read the United States, you know about a lot of the states being, having a hard time financing themselves and getting their budgets. Okay, so they've got a liability problem. But nobody ever pays attention. They're sitting on a whole bunch of assets. Okay. Now, I cannot go to any developing country without people talking about how to bring in private capital and infrastructure. But I go to the U.S. and talk, and, and there was a big study done about you know, infrastructure development. You hear President Obama talk about an infrastructure bank. No discussion of private capital in the infrastructure sector. Now, it's true that telecommunications is infrastructure in some countries and not others, and the U.S. has already got private capital there. But the, the, the wonderful story actually came from my... 
friend Mitch Daniels, the governor of Indiana, as some of you may know, Macquarie went in and, and, and sort of privatized their uh, toll road system. And this was done a few years ago. And actually, you know, Mitch did the deal at the top of the market. I think they got about three to four billion dollars for the toll road system, uh, which they put back into roads. Very politically controversial, but that it later turned out to be seen as a good deal. But the state of Pennsylvania tried to do it, and no, 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 we couldn't have private capital into our road system. Um, and it wasn't only a question of the financing, but of course, one of the things that I learned from talking to both Mitch and Macquarie was that, you know, they had part of the toll road system that when people analyzed the tolling, that they, it was costing 15 cents per toll booth. It would cost more to collect the tolls than you got from the tolls. So not surprisingly, you bring in a private operator, people put in smart cards, do different things. But the, the part about this, which is a wonderful Australian element, and that's why I'm glad we raised it, or at least I managed to get to it, was that um, at one point, I, I, a former Macquarie chairman came at, uh, it was an infrastructure conference in Singapore, and he told this story, which I think was great. He was asked to testify before the Indiana State Senate, because, you know, it's a big, big proposal. And one of the questions the Indiana senator asked him is said, well, you know, we know Australia is kind of a friend of the United States, but if you buy our toll road, and what happens if we go to war with Australia? <laughs> and this is why I love Australians. The, 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 the typical answer that I would have given would have been said, well, look, you know, Australia has been an ally of the United States. We fought with each other in every war in the 20th century. I don't think that's going to happen. So uh, this Australian gave that answer. But then on top of it, he said, but look at it this way. If we do go to war with the United States, I think we'll go after those toll roads in California before we go after yours. So, <laughs> you got a great country here. We've got, we've got one more question at the back, and then I'm going to ask uh, Professor Cameron to come and close tonight. I'm conscious it is Sunday night, and we've run over time a little bit, so we'll try and wrap it up quickly. Thank you. Please. Question from the back. Mr. Salik, um, another question from Xinhua News Station. Uh, from Xinhua News Station, say about China. Uh, just uh, as you mentioned uh, uh, in your speech, uh, China right now is over uh, is experiencing some kind of overheating uh, problems. Actually, Chinese government is based in based in, uh, is busy in uh, dealing with this kind of overheating uh, problems. And one of the very prominent. Uh, policies as, as uh, you know, the Chinese government is cracking down on the speculation in the housing market. Uh, housing market. Um, right now in China, in big cities like Beijing and Shanghai, if you have already owned a, an apartment, you're not allowed to, to get a, you know, to, 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 to get, get access to loan from the bank to have another apartment. Uh, some of the uh, economists uh, just accused uh, of that kind of policies as a kind of, you know, twisting the market. How do you comment upon uh, this kind of insight and uh, uh, how, do, how do you assess uh, Chinese government's uh, policy against the overheating problems? Thank you. Well, it obviously varies by market, but I think there was some understandable worry in some markets about the risk of, of, of price bubbles, including in housing. And I think the Chinese policy mix of today includes uh, a toolbox of administrative measures like the ones that you mentioned. Um, and I'm not in a position to second guess in what market, what measure they use. And I will say in general, I think one of the lessons that I hope the US and others learned that leading to our financial mm -hmm. crisis is to have a rich mix of supervisory policies uh, that when you start to uh, be concerned about what might be potential asset price bubbles, supervisory policies for bank regulatory systems, uh, I think uh, can be a useful part of the tool set. Having said that, in my reference to the changes, I think over time uh, China will be better served to move to more price and market signals um, than administrative measures uh, to control and structure the economy. But that's a more generalized method. So if I think about land issues, uh, if I think about the hoku system, about people moving from one part of the country to another, whether they should catch some social benefits, over time, I think China will want to move to have uh, 
uh, sort of more market-based measures, but I don't want that to be interpreted as saying in the bank supervisory area that supervisors don't have to supervise, because I think that's actually an important lesson of the recent past decade. Um, but can I have one last, because I want to share with the audience one thing about Dick Wilcott. Uh, I really appreciate uh, Dick uh, being here with me, but all of you have to appreciate uh, how Dick and I first got to know each other, because it actually <laughs> has a link with uh, uh, Paul Keating and his predecessor, Bob Hawke. Uh, I used I worked for Secretary James Baker when he was Treasury Secretary and then Secretary of State, but Treasury from 85 to 88. And uh, as we were working with the G7 uh, financial coordination system, uh, one of the ideas that Baker and I and a few others had is to say, um, given the rise of Asia, so we did get that one right, um, <laughs> we... we um, it was important for the U.S. ties to not only be based on security, but we also wanted to emphasize the economic ties. So we cooked up this idea of actually trying to put together a system of finance ministers across the Asia-Pacific, um, and we were going to try to have the first meeting late in 1988, and then Baker uh, went over to run what became President Bush 41's campaign, and I went with him, and so that idea uh, didn't get launched. And so... Uh, Fortunately, that campaign was successful, unlike some I've been in. And, and, uh, and so President Bush became President Bush, and Secretary of Treasury Baker became Secretary of State Baker, and I became an undersecretary uh, over at the State Department. And early in our tenure, um, we received a news story that said uh, Australian Prime Minister Hawke had launched this idea for a new Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation Group. And as we looked at the notice, there was no United States. <laughs> so it was doubly bad. Here we thought it was our idea. He stole it. We were left out. Um, <clears throat> so the phone lines burned a little bit. I think Gareth Evans was foreign minister at the time. Gareth, with the courage of a good member of the cabinet, uh, quickly said, I had no idea what he was saying. He didn't tell me. <laughs> um, and so... <clears throat> so... Um, uh, this was in the days of American economic leadership. We didn't really want to take this. Um, so, 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 so Dick Wolcott, uh, my first meeting with Dick Wolcott was he was sent over early in 1989 to explain this policy to us. Um, and we explained to him our view that we actually thought the United States should be part of what became APEC. Um, but I grew to admire Dick because he was so effective that even though our job was to pummel him, so he was so bloody when he back to, went back to Canberra that people realized this was not a good idea to leave out the U.S. and Canada, that you really couldn't do it. He was just too nice. He took the points well. And so we ended up launching APEC in, uh, in 1989 at the ministerial level, and Prime Minister Keating actually made it, brought it to the heads of government level. So that's how I first got to know uh, Ambassador Wilcox. Thanks very much. Thanks, Robert. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.